it's useful to think of uh, the component of hardware and software of the role of culture in each organism. So for example, a newborn king cobra is 100% king cobra. Right at birth, it is able to bite and kill and its code is hard-coded and it will be exactly the same for the rest of its life. There is very little culture. Okay, As you go up into other animals, you start getting the word culture, which is a set of learned behaviors and beliefs and heuristics and an entire operating system by the time you get to the humans. Welcome to The Scene and the Unseen. I'm just kidding. This is not The Scene and the Unseen. I'm perhaps best known for that audio podcast, which takes intense deep dives into subjects and people and can last three hours to even eight hours. But I also wanted to have a space where I can have, you know, relaxed, free-wheeling conversations, just shoot the breeze with a friend. And so welcome to Everything is Everything, a show co-hosted by me and my dear friend, Ajay Shah. And I'll hand over to Ajay and let you uh, tell him more about the show. So all of you know the podcast, The Seen and the Unseen, and it has evolved over the years into oral history, where episodes run from three to eight hours and they are deep dives into one interesting person at a time. Amit and I felt at the same time alongside this, there is a space and it is valuable to create a different concept of a show. And so here we are with Everything is Everything, which will be a mix of contemporary interesting questions of the age and we hope with elements of irreverent and amusing views on the world so we think that you guys will find this interesting okay i'm kind of perturbed he sold it so well because here's the thing we're just starting with this and the first episode is always going to kind of suck because that's what happens new medium for us. We're going to learn it as we go along. We are going to stick with it. Give us your feedback on what fun things we can do to make it better. What are the subjects you'd like to hear more about? Because we are kind of known for the serious stuff, you know, uh, policy and uh, economics and all of those things. And I really want to, you know, ha have fun on the show and talk not just about the profound, but also the profane. How did you get that interesting haircut? Yeah, the moment I said profane, I thought you were going to ask me that. <laughs> What's with the haircut is that these days I'm uh, sort of living in a village, as it were, uh, in, a, in a particular district I won't name. And uh, in that uh, village, which you know well, I uh, asked you, okay, where can I go to get, get a haircut? And you told me a particular place I can go. And that was basically the village barber shop. And I was like, cool, let me go there. So I went there, had a fun conversation. There was no electricity. I could hardly see anything in the mirror. And before I knew it, you know, the sides are gone. Haircut doesn't really suit my age. But, you know, hey, I'm a city slicker. I've come to a village. Let me just get the village haircut. I'm kind of cool with it. And of course, I sort of experienced the village life in other ways as well, because I had an encounter with a snake shortly after that. So on that note, you know, you know let's talk about the snakes. Because, um, uh, you know, how we are going to do each episode, of course, is you talk about something that interests you and we riff off that and I talk about something that interests me. And in the end, we give recommendations to our listeners that, hey, you know, check this out, check that out and all of that. And your subject today, interestingly, is not macroeconomics or climate change, or any of those things, but, uh, you know, animals, starting with snakes. So let's begin with that. <laughs> Everybody in India knows about the big four snakes, the venomous snakes that make up most of the bi most of the bad encounters between snakes and people. What is interesting is that the four are actually very different. Okay, so the first most famous one is the cobra, and actually cobras and humans have evolved a good coexistence. The cobras live around human settlements and they are well adjusted to human beings and they flash their scary hoods and the humans know to run away. And in fact, many times when a cobra apparently strikes a human, they do it with their mouth closed. So this is good coexistence that there is no violence. That everybody gets along fine. So the cobras are much less dangerous than is widely considered. Then comes the common crate. Once again, a sweet, quiet creature 
that doesn't make trouble for people and occasionally there are bad encounters because the crate comes along and tries to find the warmth of a human being and accidentally when the human is sleeping uh, crushes the snake and then you get a bad encounter mostly the crates are quiet calm and well behaved and nothing goes wrong and and the interesting part of that which you you know once told me is that you know the crate will come and lie in your bed for the warmth you turn it bites you the bite is painless and you literally die in your sleep so people die in their sleep but actually they've been bitten by a crate okay the third is the saw scaled viper which is a very small snake it almost looks like an eel and it tries to do an interesting display and scare off people and most often it succeeds other than young men who want to say i'm so clever i can pick up an eel by its tail and that goes badly and the last is the unpleasant bad tempered creature the russell's viper and these are snakes that will hit strike out at a human with no reasonable provocation so the four are actually very different in their uh, character and this is something that most people have not understood so i think there is this elevated levels of fear about cobras and crates which is not justified given that actually they are quite mild and they are uh, coordinated with the human race and they understand and interoperate with the humans so what happened to me the other day is that i was uh, you know taking rounds of your uh, walking track and i'd almost run 7k and i was completely tired walk around basically but i was completely tired and i thought man you know the la- my last little bit of jogging i thought i can't possibly go faster than this and just as i was cooling down from the bushes on the right of me uh, a snake whizzed by to the bushes on the left of me and it waited in those bushes and its tail was hanging out on the path and i was uh, you know so i don't know what to do had it disappeared i would just have continued but its tail was there it's almost like i don't you know there's an amitabh Bach- bachchan and shashi kapoor film where they are bathing together and of course they're naked and then uh, some woman opens the door i forget who and instead of doing this covering themselves like this they cover themselves like this and i thought this is a stupid snake it thinks i can't see it but the tail is there and then i was like played safe boy and i turned around and i sprinted madly uh, at a speed of what my garmin watch tells me was like 25 k- kilometers per hour which you now tell me is the highest speed man can attain <laughs> you will be a well adjusted villager when uh, the tail of a snake will no longer excite peaks of physical performance Listen this is by the way this is a joke i don't want i i have no pretensions of being a well adjusted villager i'm a city slicker who kind of really likes uh, the privileged life that i'm uh, living over here of great comfort but moving on to something you once told me i remember we were chatting by a lake side somewhere in udaipur and you told me something shocking about what otherwise i thought was a beautiful bird the seagull right so what was what, what was why are seagulls bastards as you put it you said amit i want to tell you something seagulls are bastards explain why uh, seagulls look nice they seem like you know beautiful graceful creatures but they are actually birds of prey in many ways so when we think of a eagle or we think of a vulture the image in our mind goes with the part the behavior of seagulls con- conflicts with our conception of what a seagull ought to be so we think of a seagull it should be some nice vegetarian bird okay it's not that so seagulls are known to attack and kill pigeons and eat them uh seagulls are no- there are some seagulls who find baby whales who are near the surface of the water and they swoop down and they gouge out chunks of meat from the skin of a baby whale and they leave deep wounds on the back of a baby whale when it is near the surface there are uh, reports of seagulls gouging out the eyes of seals okay things like that so seagulls are actually like pretty dangerous birds of prey and i think it's just our anthropocentric failure that when we see seagulls we think of some cute cuddly bird and its behavior is anything but that so i think that creates this cognitive dissonance in us for what we expect versus what it is yeah and what also struck me about seagulls when like what struck me most was that when they attack you they go for the eyes first you know which is uh, p- perhaps a smarter strategy because then of course you can't fight and you're kind of screwed and uh, one can just imagine how uh, they um, you know came to that evolved behavior but then makes you wonder why doesn't everybody attack like that because that's possibly an optimal way of attacking and seagulls interestingly not only are they bastards they're lazy bastards because another thing they do is what is called kleptoparasitism where uh, you know they'll steal food of other 
parasites which is also stealing food from elsewhere it's like stealing from a thief in a sense and when i read about that i straight away thought of the indian state especially you know back in the license raj days you would have your rent seekers and then you'd have the state on top of that taxing the rent seekers or the taxing the cronies as it were and uh, you know uh, kind of pretty messed up that way the other thing that strikes me about this whole animal kingdom like when we talk about the vagaries of the animal kingdom taking out eyes and doing all kinds of funky things is that we describe this behavior in an almost a moral way so we're not attaching moral judgment to it you know jokingly theke bol diya seagulls are bastards but we're not attaching moral judgment and all of that animals are animals they do what they do there's a food chain and the thing is we're also animals even if we've given this veneer of rationality though we know so much of what we consider reasoning is really rationalization for wherever our instincts take us and so we've got this veneer but at the end of the day we are also animals in fact if anything we are more deeply fucked up than most other animals because we have so many conflicting instincts coming at us in different directions plus um you know all the social pressures and all of those things around us and yet there is moral judgment attached to everything humans do and there's a kind of dilemma in that because whether or not you believe in free will and i think it's a difficult concept to defend but we can talk about that in some other episode but whether or not you believe in that if you sort of accept that we are all creatures formed by a combination of our genes and circumstances on the one hand that could take you to the place where we look at each other like we look at animals and we don't pass judgment but on the other hand for society to function you must have a system where you have an ethical code in place where you punish the bad and you reward the good and that is just what you need for society to function so i'm i'm kind of just thinking aloud what do you think it's useful to think of uh the component of hardware and software of the role of culture in each organism so for example a newborn king cobra is 100% king cobra right at birth it is able to bite and kill and its code is hard coded and it will be exactly the same for the rest of its life there is very little culture okay as you go up into other animals you start getting the word culture which is a set of learned behaviors and beliefs and heuristics and an entire operating system by the time you get to the humans so humans are unique in that we can ask ourselves what is our culture and we can refashion it in ways that the animals can't so i think that's the way to distinguish that we are immoral about what a king cobra does but we think about who we are and what is our code and we are masters of our own destiny because to some extent we are able to interrogate and modify that operating system so culture that plasticity is what makes us human so we are not just hard coded in the cpu but we have an operating system on top of it so i feel that's a nice and fundamental difference and that is the essence of what makes us human that's a lovely metaphor but what also strikes me is that it actually plays to my point like if my point is that character is contingent right and i am shaped by both the software and the hardware i have my genes and i have my instincts and like i love this phrase by steven pinker where he said nature gives us knobs nurture turns them right that's a interface of uh, uh, software and hardware right hardware is a knobs and nature is how much they are sort of turned and we have knobs of for different instincts to different degrees and then nurture turns them but how much in control are we really because i think what often happens in human beings is that with in our hubris we overestimate our own agency and i'm not making an argument for uh, a kind of um, uh, for just excusing everything everybody does and saying are ye bechara kya karega character is contingent blah 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 i i'm not doing that at all i think that even if there is no free will for civilization to progress we must behave as if there is and even if people are not really at the deepest level responsible for their actions we must behave as they are even looking at hardware software i think that's 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 I think it's good to think that we are works in progress. We are halfway to coal, halfway to diamonds, and we each of us try to interrogate the operating system, as it were, to look beyond a decision to the algorithm that made the decision. So I always like to say, don't judge a decision by its outcome, because the world is probabilistic. There are many surprises, but it's good to go deeper. and think of where those things came from so when uh, you are ambushed by an event you will be- behave in ways that are deeply instinctive 
and then it's interesting to demand of ourselves to be reflective and then wonder that was that instinctive response the right one and can we step out of the frame and introspect and debate about that culture so i think we are all capable of that it's shades of gray neither extreme is true so i just park myself in the camp of there is a striving and as long as we will keep striving it's a good thing and this also leads us to uh, the deep question is it an uncle's fault that he is an uncle amit what is the interesting and cool idea you want to show us today I'm not sure how interesting and cool it is but it's it's a thought that was sparked off by something that Shaina Bhattacharya who wrote the book Desperately Seeking Shah Rukh and I did a great episode of the scene and the unseen with her um the loneliness of the indian woman and I was doing a book event with her and there she paid me what I think is one of the finest compliments I've ever received where she said Amit you're an anti uncle so I said okay what do you mean by anti uncle because it's a lovely compliment i know lekin thoda elaborate to kijiye so she said that here's the thing you're willing to change you're willing to listen to arguments from the other side on everything your mind is not closed you're always open to ideas and you're willing to engage with anyone and that makes you an anti uncle thereby sort of implying that an uncle is the opposite of that someone who's completely closed they've got their world view they've got you know their way of thinking about everything and they insistent on that and obviously there are other things we'll associate with that term uncle such as perhaps a certain age uh, a certain gender obviously because only men can be uncles or frank women can be karens i guess so whatever but you can find other terms and and all of that and that led me to thinking about one of the finest essays i have read in recent years of four quadrants of conformism by the by paul graham who is such a wonderful essay writer and in that paul graham talks about how there are really four kinds of people right there are uh, like there are two broad kinds which are the conventional minded and the independent thinkers and those also you can divide into two kinds there are the passively conventional minded and the aggressively conventional minded and there are the passively independent thinkers and the aggressively independent thinkers so i just want to read out uh, a para by uh, uh, graham very elaborates on that in adulthood we can recognize the four types by their distinctive calls much as you could recognize four species of birds the call of the aggressively conventional minded is crush out group is rather alarming to see an exclamation point after a variable but that's a whole problem with the aggressively conventional minded the call of the passively conventional minded is what will the neighbors think the call of the passively independent minded is to each his own and the call of the aggressively independent minded is epur simuave Epur se moave is, of course, what Galileo said. It means still it turns. So Galileo was essentially forced to recant his observation that the Earth goes around the Sun, and he had to recant it, and he had to say I was wrong, and I didn't really do that. And then when he came out after that whole episode, he looked up at the sky and he stormed the ground and he said Epur se se moave, you know, and still it turns. So you can make me, uh, for, uh, you know, uh, verbally fall in line with the conventional minded, but that doesn't change the reality and. this is something that i feel in my time as a columnist and no doubt in your time as a columnist you would have suffered from as well because the loudest noise on twitter and social media is actually made by the aggressively conventional minded these are not people saying anything new these are people vehemently defending received wisdom about which they haven't thought at all right for example i have three distinctive examples and the links will be uh, in the show notes below of columns i have written which got furious responses and the first one made the argument that even though we've been taught in school that population is india's greatest problem it's not people are brains not stomachs and you can give various examples but i think the clearest illustration of that to me is that the story of human history is a migration from uh, you know villages and rural areas to big cities the population density is highest because the more people there are people are brains not stomachs you know it uh, all all kind of um, it, it just makes sense and therefore i find it shocking that everything that is blamed on the population is actually a problem of governance a problem with the state and everyone who says population is a problem will never include themselves as part of the population yeah they'll be like you stop having babies and uh, so again um, uh, my column will be linked down below another fashion that i keep railing about is when people say inequality when they mean poverty or should mean poverty inequality and poverty are really different things and i um, you know clarify this by talking about by asking the question in which of these two countries would you rather be poor the usa or bangladesh 
and everybody would even though bangladesh is recently doing really well everybody would rather be poor in the usa but the truth is that the usa has much more inequality as measured by the gini coefficient than bangladesh does that inequality per se is in the problem after liberalization happened we started solving poverty to some extent we moved hundreds of millions of people out of poverty more than 400 million people out of poverty as inequality went up and it's a result of the zero sum mindset that oh if the rich are getting richer the poor must be getting poorer but to me there are really different problems with opposite solutions and india's problem is poverty again much more detail in the article below so do uh, sort of read that and and my third piece which really pissed off so many people that people who hadn't been in touch with me th since 35 years ago in school got in touch with me on facebook to tell me i was an asshole and that argument meant a bit provocatively was that it is immoral to have children and the fundamental argument i was kind of making there was that uh, you know there are three things i think we would all agree on we should not do so something to anyone without their consent we should not cause anyone pain and we should not kill anyone and when we give birth to kids obviously it's without their consent because consent is impossible they will feel pain and they will die and therefore just for that reason it is prima facie immoral and you have to tackle this argument right so it's meant to be a little bit provocative and to make you think about these questions and i would be the first one to say that i might think things are immoral but i might do them anyway right so we are humans we are fucked up that's how it is but man the flack i kind of got for this but the point is not these three articles per se i mean both of us have lots of provocative thoughts but the point and the paul paul graham also makes is that the aggressively conventional minded are the people who stand in the way of progress they are not saying anything new they are stating the conventional wisdom but they are doing it loudly and they are shutting you up and they simply do not want uh, dialogue and on, on this at all and they are incredibly dangerous and they are the loudest on social media whether they are conventional minded in terms of following the conventions of their particular tribe which could be right wingers which could be wokes which could be whatever but they'll follow those conventions and they've mugged up those conventions and those key phrases and that's it there's no sense of dialogue of learning of yearning for truth and uh, so on and so forth so this is something that i want everyone to think about that like i realized that whenever i would hear a radically new idea my initial response to it was kin are no it would be a negative response and i learned to fight that in myself i learned to say that you know every idea that changes the world is at first a radical idea and you've got to be open to everything and think about everything and that's what i'll ask all the listeners to do that you know never dismiss anything out of sight always keep thinking about stuff and in some ways you might be conventional minded perhaps because you're used to a set of ways or a frame of looking at the world but don't be aggressively conventional minded it is interesting to ask the question what is optimal for the person so because i'm a card carrying economist i always look at it through the lens of optimization people are not wood people are not stones people are optimizers so it has often been remarked that in the world of social media there is this tribalism people want the warmth and the sense of connection to networks in order to navigate life better so it's interesting and important think that why do people become uncles why do people loudly enforce social norms because they think it's a ticket to power and success so i think it's an important insight into the world to think not that the uncles are deep believers of that ideology but they are riding that ideology as a path to achieving power Uh, I'm reminded of the fall of the USSR and the fall of the Berlin Wall, where Timur Kuran coined the phrase "preference falsification," which describes the phenomenon where three months before the collapse of communism, everybody in East Germany and everybody in the USSR would profess a complete consistency with the official beliefs, with what was required to survive and get along in that. system of government and in their heart nobody had those beliefs but it was wise and efficient to say that as a way to get along as a way to gain power so some people would passively get along with the official ideology others would aggressively police violators of those rules so i am quite uh, kind to the aggressive Uh, conformists and the uncles because i just think that i'll roll my eyes and say whatever 
this is your belief system that you think achieves success and group membership and power today but it's contingent because the world will change and these people will turn on a dime so it's like in indian politics we describe some people as opportunists i think the world is actually less messy than meets the eye this is all a show there's a performance there's a performative aspect that is being put on in the quest for power it's not that people actually believe this so i feel quite kind towards a lot of those people and it's okay you're just doing it because it's a game you're playing right now and your combination will change tomorrow i love your kindness and i'm happy to accept that as an explanation but not a justification because more and more especially in these times where social media amplifies everything uh, the consequences can be harsh and by the way i'm i'm so impressed that you told me you know last evening that timur kuran was actually your teacher he taught you and i keep citing his book public lies private truths uh, and preference falsification and indeed the whole the other phrase that came from that book preference cascades where suddenly when you realize that hey everybody else is also against the soviets then you know there's a cascade and they can go that way and for me that's also an expla- um, that's an explanation for example why the modi wave happened that i and i'll term, you know phrase this a little harshly um and you can disagree on the specific point but i uh, always think that indian society has always been deeply illiberal and of course it contains multitudes of aspects of it are liberal but always been deeply illiberal and there were many uncles within us and aunties within us for example or young people within us who were closet bigots but who could never say so openly you know at one point it was you couldn't say in polite society that i don't like muslims or muslims are having too many children or a woman's places in the kitchen you couldn't say this openly and i think what happened with social media is that there was a preference cascade where that falsification was not necessary where bigots looked around and realized that fuck actually there are a lot of bigots like me actually the majority of the people are bigots actually this is my tribe i can openly be who i am and not worry about it you know and uh, you know no longer politicians no longer needed to dog whistle for example you could just say the wildest things openly and you could say that you know i remember uh, glen reynolds aka insta pandit legendary blogger once wrote that this was the reason for trump's rise over there that all the xenophobia could come out that if trump could say hey mexicans are rapists then everybody can uh, you know um embrace him because their prejudices go in a similar direction but without uh, whatever and i think in uh, modern times these have consequences like especially when you see what happens on social media and i've been the target of both right wing mobs and woke mobs at different times and I- i've seen friends suffer through that you know uh, hussein haidri who has been on the scene and the unseen once told me that when he was mobbed by the right wing guys he said he felt so alone that no one called him to say how, how you know that i am with you or how are you feeling and i've realized that when i am the target also that i might have many well wishers i'm really privileged to have friends but no one realizes what you're going through when within an hour you find a thousand people abusing you and retweeting you and just kind of messing with you mm-hmm. and actions of consequences and this kind of uh, aggressively conventional minded mob behavior can then have a chilling effect on our discourse where uh, people aren't willing to say the things they feel till ultimately they don't even feel that way anymore at some future date we should talk further we have different opinions on the appropriate place of social media in our life i am a dissenter and i'm completely away from all social media but at the same time as thinkers about the world we need to recognize that that is where the world is so i think there are two separate decisions one is what should i do and the other is in und- coldly understanding how this phenomenon is acting upon the world and both are interesting questions for the future we'll discuss it in the in a future episode but there are also two aspects to it which is the personal aspect and which is a public intellectual aspect and the personal aspect that i have chosen is to use um, you know kashinath singh's famous phrase from kashi ka asi where he says uh, uh, duniya hum bajaye harmonia so my personal approach is harmonia right so i'm not going to really bother about stuff i'm going to block every toxic thing i see anyone who's rude i'm going to block them anyone who uh, you know trolls me i'm going to block them and i am instead going to use it as a curation device where um i um build a feed of the finest minds in the world and it's such a it's so magical like imagine when i was growing up you know when in 1985 for example uh, or 1995 i could not have imagined that every morning i can wake up in the morning and have access to the best minds in the world thinking aloud for my benefit that is fucking magic 
right so i'm i'm going to curate something like that and that's a personal aspect the harmonia aspect then the question is as a public intellectual what do you do because as a public intellectual when you take unpopular positions counterintuitive positions positions that are not conventional and therefore will set the aggressively conventional minded against you you bear a cost perhaps to your career certainly i feel to your mental health and you really then have to be clear about you know what is my role in this game that i'm playing and i can take a step back and say okay i do the podcast and i'm playing the long game and i don't have to be too much out there and i have been too much out there and i've suffered for it but yeah i mean these are just two areas we can talk about at a future date in 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 the book the art and science of economic policy kelkar and i have argued that there is a market failure in the criticism business because the critic personally takes the brunt of all the attacks that come by but actually all the progress of the world is only made possible by the critics so there is just something fundamentally unbalanced between the cost and benefit it's an externality problem the critic induces a positive externality upon the world while paying a very high cost for herself so i think that's an interesting distinction that maybe social media has amplified the size of the market failure maybe in the good old days you could be a critic and the cost of being a critic was lower amit what's your recommendation for this week so every week we're going to give a couple of recommendations and um more often than not i'm going to talk about books and before i go to my specific recommendations i want to talk about books a little bit first and what they mean to me right one of the beautiful things that has happened because of the scene and the unseen is that there is now this meme that has sprung up called the scene and the unseen bookshelf where you know i give extensive show notes every book my uh, uh, guest mentions or i mention it will be there in the show notes people uh, often get those books in fact someone said that the amazon algo indicates that that if you you know go to the page of one book recommended by me you will find other five books recommended by amazon which have no connection to each other or to the central book but they've all been recommended by me in the reading list. so uh, I, and i find that really heartening and it also goes to the heart of the lie of what people say that in this modern world people have short attention spans and they don't read anymore and all of that and that's not true that's not true i mean my show indicates and maybe i'll elaborate on that at some day but the scene in the unseen indicates that yeah there are moments where we have short attention spans we are you know scrolling up and down or swiping or whatever but we all crave depth we all want to understand the world and you know and reading isn't dying at all and to me the importance of reading also is and i'll link to a column down below about that but i feel look we make sense of the world by connecting dots how do we connect those dots in our personal experience we'll find very few dots and it will take us many years to get them but books give us the ability to collect many dots very fast and this is especially true of fiction you know where which allow us not only to sort of live our own one life the one life that we are given but to live the lives of others and i find that something that is so magical and beautiful and uh, you know a gift that we are given and that we don't make enough use of and uh, so the book i am going to recommend in episode 1 is a beautiful book which uh, you know brings this home so vividly is called the curious incident of the dog in the night time by mark hadden and uh, i'll quickly you know uh, quote hadden's own words on what this book exactly uh, is about So now the book is about a 15-year-old boy with Asperger's syndrome who is trying to find out who killed his neighbor's dog. So it's ostensibly a murder mystery, but written in the, in the boy's voice, and and that's just beautiful. And the way Haddon describes it is this: "Curious Incident" is not a book about Asperger's. It's a novel whose central character describes himself as quote a mathematician with some behavioral difficulties. Stop quote. Indeed, he never uses the word Asperger's or autism. I slightly regret the fact that the book Asperger's was used on the cover. If anything, it's a novel about difference. about being an outsider about seeing the world in a surprising and revealing way is as much a novel about us as it is about christopher stop quote and you know that that kind of sums up uh, you know that whole aspect of seeing the world through 
the, the eyes of others. Like I remember there's this great uh, philosophical essay of the early 70s by Thomas Nag Nagel called What Is It Like to Be a Bat? And bat of course, bats, of course, don't have eyes. They navigate the world through something called echolocation. So they kind of, you know, see the world through sound, as it were. And Nagel's point was that we can describe this experience and we know how scientifically it works, but we can never actually imagine it. It is outside our imagination. But the beautiful thing about human life is that we do imagine it and you can give scientific reasons for that like you know V.S. Ramchandran once met me at a TED event and told me all about mirror neurons before he wrote the book in which he spoke about it at length where we have mirror neurons in our brain which mimic the experiences of others when we hear about them and therefore lead to you know empathy and compassion and all of those things and we are actually wired to empathize with each other and we are wired for connection and community and all of these things and there is nothing that amplifies this in us uh, you know, and makes life worth living, frankly, to me, than to be able to experience the lives and thoughts of others. I want to amplify that beyond fiction. Okay, so if you think of the project of trying to be here and understand the world, I find it very useful to think of a personal project where we take a bag of experiences and actions and those feedback loops and we build a model of the world. And that sort of, we each of us get to play one life and we build some knowledge out of that one life. At its best for me, the great non-fiction books of the world are each the trajectory of one life. So you've got one after another great people who are building books of ideas. And when we read those books and when we digest those books, we're living one extra life and one extra life for each of them. So uh, sometimes pejoratively, people describe the life of many a practitioner as living the same day over and over. And that leads to very little knowledge, that leads to very little insight. And I think of reading books of great ideas as the other extreme, because each of the people who has built one or two important main ideas books through their lives are actually giving us one extra life in which we get to look at the world and think about the world and build a body of knowledge. So, yes, there are many pedestrian books and, you know, I'm not saying all books are big, ambitious books of ideas, but I find big, ambitious books of ideas to be breathtaking moments where I almost feel like I added one life to my experience because I got to see the world through the eyes of somebody who has lived and thought from scratch and seen the world in novel and refreshing ways. And I am made of all those books. And I think it is so much nicer to be standing on a life of that reading over and above one's petty little life of experience. So I think that that is something magical that books can do for us. Yeah, and, and just through the thought just came to mind that, you know, some people will often talk about books and especially novels and especially fiction books as escapism. And I, I think it's the opposite that books offer you not an escape from life, but an embrace of it. And and uh, therefore, we should all read more and more. And you can start with the curious incident of the dog in the nighttime. So, Ajay, you know, we've done our book for the week, as it were. But moving away from books, what's your recommendation for the book? So, I just evangelized the glory of big, ambitious books of ideas. But my recommendation for today is uh, a music album by U2, which is called Songs of Surrender. Uh, U2 is a band that has been around forever. And uh, they have put together some of their old works, 40 songs, a little bit of new and mostly old. And uh, I found it interesting that they have reimagined those songs in a more mature and grown-up way. So they were kids when they did many of those things. And here they're looking back at the song and the world and reimagining the song Many times the musical arrangement is different. Many times the uh, lyrics have been edited in interesting ways. So it's not a formula. So there is an MTV unplugged is a certain formula. This is not that. This is thinking from scratch about what a lot of us know well. And I found it deeply interesting. I also found it interesting to think that maybe there are people today who will do this backwards. Maybe there are young people today who will start at Songs of Surrender and then go back much later to Joshua Tree and Unforgettable Fire and so on. So I was just fascinated at this 
new album that landed about two months ago. And this reminds me of the phrase that you used earlier about, uh, you know, when you eloquently said that we're works in progress between uh, coal, between coal and diamond. And the thing about artists is, and by the way, I must say that uh, our wonderful producers Vartika and Rakshita just before this referred to us as artists, and I was like so sort of uh, thrilled by that. That okay, artist, bola liya ab to ho gaya, ab to matlab ki ab kya baaki hai. But um, an interesting thing that happens is artists are always evolving and they're always creating but the way their work has come in the marketplace so far and it's changing and i'll talk about how but the way it's come in the marketplace so far is that time and again artists are forced to essentially ossify themselves into one static thing and that becomes them so for example you two records a joshua tree and that version of with or without you performed at that particular time by those particular boys is a version everybody knows and everybody craves you know radio Head, for example, is sick of performing creep. That was a breakaway hit, of course, but it was written when they were immature young men. It's an angsty teenagerish kind of song, and sure, it's a great song, but they're sick of performing it because that's not who they are. They have moved on. I had a great episode of the scene in the unseen with um, uh, the musician Gaurav Chintamani, and he's riffed on the same theme as well. That it's tragic that 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 sometimes getting a big hit can be a curse because then wherever you go, people are just. you know shouting that song at you and you've changed you've moved on you're a different person but you're ossified into that one three minute package thing that you did 20 years ago and in a sense what you two is doing with this and to, to me this is is much better they they did this than an album of all new songs because they're saying that you know that these songs that you know that was one moment in time we are evolving we are changing this is this moment in time it could be something else entirely a little later and and part of the reason they were forced to ossify themselves was that they were limited by form in the sense that you know you had those conventional forms of the 3 minute pop song and the 40 minute album and it has to come out this way and the industry function then this way ki aap album nikalo fir aap do saal tour karo fir all ek album nikalo and then you become an old band and you only come to india and uh, you know perform hits of 40 years ago Uh, which also happens to people but today in modern times you know bands can just go on youtube they can meet their fans on discord they can have live jamming sessions a song is always changing from day to day to day and i find uh, that journey sort of fascinating and the ability to kind of you know be able to do that so i agree with everything you say but uh, it applies equally on a bigger scale that for the project of thinking about the world and deciphering the world and acting upon the world we each of us are on a journey and no man can cross the same river twice he is not the same and the river is not the same so i think that when we look back at the things that we have written earlier and the things that we have done earlier it will always be the case that the world looks different today as it should and that's the point so in exactly that same fashion when people get stuck in amber and are held around one crystalline conception of an idea or an action that's not fair to their own journey and we should also be very generous about the ideas and actions of people because they were contextual in that place and in the state of mind of that person so you know the gandhi ji of 1919 is very different from the gandhi ji of 1939 and the world has evolved and the person has evolved and i think it's very uh, useless to try to hang on to the claims and the beliefs and the arguments of a person at any one point in time because a person is much more rich and interesting than that yeah absolutely we contain multitudes and another thought that strikes me tell me what you think about it is that you know when i think of books i'm always itching to read new things discover new authors when i think of cinema i'm always itching to see new world cinema and really uh embrace that like the mami film festival has for meant until covid for many years was like my yearly vacation i just fucking loved it you know um uh, discovering so many new films but when it came to music i found that i had kind of slowed down that i only listened to old comfort music for you know from my college days and i didn't really discover much new stuff and even a lot of the new stuff i like is actually covers 
of uh, you know great new covers of older songs that I've already heard. So very few exceptions. So I thought maybe it's just me. I'm growing old, so I listen to old comfort music. But Ted Joya had uh, a really interesting article which we link from the show notes, where uh, his point was that uh, he looked at the data and he said that actually, if you look at it, old music is outselling new music by a mile. It seems like the whole model has changed. That uh, you know people are g- still going crazy on your Beatles and Springsteen and from whom the title of the show is derived. Maybe we'll talk about it in the next episode. And so on, these older artists. And and I, and I wonder what's kind of happened there. Because, you know, if you what often happens is that we are so focused on the present that we look at a particular point in time, that we look at the way the world is and we think it will always be like this. And we might even foolishly imagine it was always like this. But the truth is things change very fast. The shape of the music industry, which really shaped modern rock and roll and whatever, was uh, really a, a, a sort of a... And I think this is a point Steve Van Zandt uh, made, that uh, you know, rock and rock began when Dylan went electric and ended when Kurt Cobain died. And you know, it was that sort of period of time which was this thing and then and in many ways it's a good thing because means of access became available to everyone musicians didn't need to rely on mainstream labels to distribute themselves audiences got splintered which is great because more and more people could discover deep personal preferences but what are sort of as someone who's so deeply into music and I don't think people who know you would really know this because they think of you as a dry economist kind of person so people who don't know you may not realize this but as someone who's so deeply into music what is sort of your sense of this do you listen to new music are you always trying to discover stuff so I want to say three things Um, halfway to coal halfway from diamonds is stolen from an REM song okay (laughs) Uh, second uh, I liked uh, YouTube music for the discovery function. So they've got this, give me a playlist. I don't want to think about it. And they will spring new stuff at you. And I have been astonished at newer things that have come my way, which I've liked. And I like to discover new things. And YouTube music has often bought, brought me new things. The third thing is that what you say is very interesting. Uh, so here are some perspectives. One claim, which there is a body of research that supports, is that we have a limited zone of plasticity in our mind. So roughly from age 16 to 26, we fix on some music that our parents had and we get identified with certain genres and certain sources of music and we basically ossify on our music for the rest of our life. Okay, That is indeed a claim. But if that was true, then the evidence that you described would not arise. Because if you count the head counts of the people who were around in the 70s and the 80s, that's a very small number today. And yet Dark Side of the Moon remains one of the most successful albums of all time. So there is clearly something going on which is more than that. Um, I have a claim that this is all the fault of the macroeconomists. Okay, so here's my logic. The macroeconomists conquered business cycles. Okay, so Robert Lucas famously said that when you look at the crisis and the response of 2008, he says we won. So we headed off some nightmare, we headed off the calamity, the Great Depression gave us Adolf Hitler, the 2008 crisis only gave us Donald Trump. Okay, so we've clearly come a long way. And when you look at the evidence, clearly modern business cycles have been attenuated. But Uh, that has shattered the world of music because you needed that angst, you needed the misery, you needed the hardship of the bad times as fuel for the music. So I think that the great music will come out of Russia and China and the horrible places of the world where there is abject human tragedy around us. That's the fuel that makes music. I agree that art is more likely to emerge out of pain and suffering and difficult times and so on. But I would also say that we are extremely fortunate in having escaped some of that so far, um, um, uh, you, you know, and not living in such difficult times. But people around us in our own country do go through extreme difficulty and live in those kinds of times. So. It, it, it could well be the fuel for masterpieces of art in all ways. So... There is a reason why we got a Rabindranath Tagore coming about in a very difficult time of this country. He was personally privileged, but he was the kind of person that was wired into what was happening in the world around him. So it could well be that 
good art is counter cyclical again to use macroeconomics that good times are the worst thing that you can supply as fuel for the young people who would then go on to build the art so you know before we end like a final question and i asked this to eric weinstein in an uh, scene on scene episode i did with him and my postulation was this that if you look at uh, like obviously there are more people alive in the world today than ever before and the you know and it is a much and these people who are alive in the world a mu- much higher absolute number of them are empowered to create art than ever before right so if you look at the renaissance period and the great artists it gave you and if you look at different periods of time where art flourished and all of that and my argument is that your sample size of people who have the luck and the access and the ability to create great art is orders of magnitude bigger than ever before so you should therefore technically imagine much greater works of art coming out now than ever before and uh, if that is not happening it can be because of a number of reasons maybe we are overvaluing and overrating uh, you know works of the past maybe works of the past are important because they open new doorways and there aren't so many new doorways to open or maybe in these times you are actually getting those masterpieces and many more of them but in a splintered uh, sort of um, uh, economy where you know there is no one mainstream anymore and uh, you know people are listening to different niches or whatever maybe they're getting lost and maybe you know many of um, uh, you know many of them never come to prominence at all like bach really became a big thing like decades after he was dead you know billy joel was almost piano man almost disappear into oblivion there's a very moving story i'll link from the show notes about how one particular guy loved the song piano man so much that he went to radio station after radio station after radio station saying please play this please play this and finally he did a trade off with one guy almost bribed him in a sense um, uh, you know at a big radio station to play the song and the song became a hit and billy joel who wasn't going to do any more music then made so many more albums so there's so much luck involved as well and so what's kind of, and eric of course disagreed vehemently and he said no that was great art how can you even say that but i feel that hey you know there are so many more people alive today who also have the llms they also have access to great much more great art of the future of the past which they can get inspired by so you'd imagine that there's greater potential for that now so first i agree with you that there is a problem okay so i i wouldn't let off our world lightly that you know the foundation so think of the number of people in india who have the means the luxury the ability to buy a sitar okay and get a teacher and so on it is orders of magnitude bigger than it used to be so you know statistically there should be some tales and there should be amazing things that are coming out so i'm not ready to let off the world so lightly and as i said my argument is it's the fault of the macro economists uh i want to link this to a related debate that has been taking place in the world of science okay so you look back for example at the great feats of science of the olden days rutherford famously has a picture where he's holding in his hands the assembly in which he fired alpha particles at gold foil and discovered that there is such a thing as a nucleus and those were simple contraptions that created remarkable insights now compared to that the number of scientists has exploded the money that goes into the science and the machine of the universities and uh, labs has exploded but by all accounts there is a sense that the pace of fundamental innovation has slowed down so we don't get the four papers by einstein in one year each of which was a world shattering paper that opened new vistas so i think there is a concern that something about the machine something about the modern world is interfering with the great leaps and i think it's interesting and important to wonder why i don't want to belabor the next question which is so what has gone wrong and how can it be changed but right now i just want to say that exactly as in art i think there is a question in the world of science that you've driven up the funding a million fold you've driven up the resourcing of the brains that are being put into it 10000 fold how come we're just you know building trivial things like food delivery apps and what i consider a relatively trivial innovation the llms well so much of food delivery apps uh, we should uninstall them from our phones and cook our own food and on that note i think it's sort of you know 
time to say goodbye and so our first episode comes to an end here and uh, uh, you know give us feedback tell us what we can do better what you'd like to hear us talk about what went right what went wrong uh, so we'll we're just going to kind of learn as we go along because we're really new to this this video thing i like to keep joking that i have a face for audio which clearly you can see is true so uh, uh, so thanks for your patience so so far and we'll see you next week <laughs>